Well, welcome to Eclata Witnesses. My name is Robert Pears. In this episode, I want to look at going from trial to triumph, and I'm sharing the story of Catherine Kuhlman during the time period where she would marry Burroughs Waltrip and derail her ministry. You know, you look at this lady, and we're looking at her in light of the restored woman who came back from this very difficult time. Many great heroes of faith would make similar mistakes and their ministry would be completely derailed and never come back. Catherine Coleman said something, and I think we can learn a lot from this. Why he called me, I do not know. The only reason I can give you is the fact that I had knew nothing and I never got, forgot from whence I came. He had taken me my nothing and used it for his glory. She had and always kept this humility about her and recognized that she was a nobody that God had raised up. And I think the fact that she maintained a humble heart, we're going to see as we look at her story how God was continually convicting her through it. And she knew it. And ultimately, as she surrendered to that conviction, God was able to bring her back and restore her. So if you've gone through some things, you've made some bad decisions, I want you to know that God is the God who can redeem and restore if we will humble ourselves, repent, seek His face, and do what is necessary. You're going to discover that it's easy to make the mistake and, you know, fall into the wilderness. But it's hard and it's a costly thing to get out, as Catherine Coleman would learn. Now. Catherine Coleman, I've done a complete documentary on, and I've done an episode looking at her early life. But I need to recap a little bit so that you understand something. Catherine Coleman, when she was 17, uh, joined her sister, Myrtle, and her um, husband, and she began um, traveling with them as they evangelized in the Northwest. They would ultimately recognize the call on her life, and in 1924, uh, enrolled her in the Bible Institute in Seattle. Now, they had certain rules, and Catherine Coleman ultimately was expelled because she kept having these midnight rendezvous, which was against the rules of the Institute. What we see here is that Catherine Coleman has clear weaknesses that God is seeking to address early on to prevent her derailing. So from there, she would go to Los Angeles where she would attend or at least uh, go to certain Bible classes of the Life Bible School, which was under Amy Simple McPherson. That was a lady that she considered a role model and is that she greatly looked up to. During this time period, uh, she was invited to come preach in Boise, Idaho. And she would have an appointment with Destiny and meet up with a Helen Gulliford, a woman that was an accomplished pianist, and uh, they would join together and form the God's Girls. Now, they would travel throughout the whole of Idaho, and Catherine said she preached in every town and village in Idaho. Uh, if you look at today, it's still a remote place, but can you imagine going back uh, into the 20s, late 20s, and, and, and preaching in Idaho. They would, of course, preach during the Depression years, so it was a very difficult time period. Um, and Catherine Coleman had to lay on haystacks and, and sleep in chicken coops. Uh, she paid a heavy price, her and Helen, but ultimately they started to see momentum develop. And by 1933, January 1933, they would preach at a Methodist church in Idaho Falls to a crowd of over 2,000. It was the biggest crowd that Methodist church had ever seen. 
So Catherine Coleman and Helen figure out that it's time to take the next step, which was to uh, go to Colorado. And they actually hire a manager to support them. They start off in Steamboat Springs, which they considered to be a gateway into Colorado. Uh, and here they would meet up with the Fuchs, uh, and I, hopefully I pronounced their name correctly. This was a couple that were connected to the Chicago Stone Church, which was the Azusa of Chicago. They met, Hel or met Catherine, and they recognized that she needed help. And they worked with her in terms of her theolo uh, theology and in her preaching. Well, Catherine Coleman would then leave, and they went to uh, Pueblo, which is on the southeast side of Colorado. Here they rented a Masonic Hall, and Catherine began preaching. Um, and the, the Masonic Hall was close to right by a theater. And so she would start to name her sermons catchy titles to try to attract the crowds that were going to the theater. Ultimately, she started to see crowds of about 700 people coming uh, to her services. Well, Catherine then felt it was time to move on to Denver, and in the summer of 1933, she actually went to Denver, and they decided, you know, she had a mindset, you know, um, God is a big God, and either we go big or we go home. While they didn't have money, she trusted that God would meet their needs. And what you see in Catherine is that she was not a manipulator to get money, but a truster, and there's a big difference, and I want to underline that and come back to it. They would rent a warehouse which had belonged to Montgomery Ward, uh, and it's interesting that that warehouse was actually across the street from the auditorium where Amy Semple McPherson had, had a, held revivals uh, just over a decade earlier. That auditorium is still there today, though the warehouse that they converted into the Denver Revival Tabernacle is gone and has been replaced with a hotel, and at this time of recording, it is a Marriott, and I've actually stayed there. So Catherine Coleman took this warehouse, and they began to renovate it and convert it to a church that would seat 2,000 people. Um, very quickly, she started to see crowds coming. And it's during this time period in 1934 that, of course, she'd have the famous incident where she hears that her father has had a serious accident. At that time, getting back to um, Concordia, Missouri was not an easy thing. It took a long time. And if you look at the roads at the time, they didn't have expressways. Uh, it was not an easy trip home. And by the time she gets home, of course, her father has died. And this became a very difficult time because Catherine was extremely close to her father and her father had been injured in a car accident. And of course, that would that had killed him. And you see that Catherine initially becomes very bitter and angry against the person that had uh, hit her father and ultimately killed him. But it becomes a time where God works on her, and ultimately she comes to a place of forgiveness because God is able to convict and touch her heart. And this is so powerful about this lady is that she is easily touched by the Lord and put right. Well, 1935, um, Catherine Coleman is now seeing crowds over 2,000, sometimes up to 3,000 a night at her tabernacle. She brings along many famous ministries, including Raymond Ritchie and another mine, a guy called Burroughs Waltrip. He had a very successful ministry, and I want to preach, uh, quote something regarding him. It was said that people who sat under Waltrip's ministry learned that he could preach his sensational and dynamic sermons much easier than he could apply them to his own life. To some, Waltrip became the personification of Sinclair Lewis's 1927 
Elmer Gantry, a fictional preacher who, if created in the latter period, would have been a natural in front of a television camera hawking the prosperity gospel and trinkets from the Holy Land. So you get a sense of what this guy was like. He preached revival, but he also pushed hard offerings. And many people talk about having to sit in their wallets because they had put aside money to pay for food and clothing. And he would just keep pushing for more, more and more money in his offerings. He was married uh, to a woman called Jesse, and they had two sons living in Austin, Texas. At the same time, he was building this glorious church in Mason, Iowa. And I want to quote regarding this church so you can get a sense here. Um, in reality, the radio chapel was shaping up to be one of the nation's first seeker-sensitive, media-driven ministries. Although projection screens, disappearing pulpits, and indirect lighting are common in America today, these things were unheard of in Catherine's day. Now, they had these projection screens where the, the, the words for the songs were displayed um, on the wall, much like we do today. Um, it was a beautiful, the seats were uh, blue and white. There was blue, white, and silver was the colors of this amazing church that he was building in Mason, Iowa. But it was costing a lot of money. And so he had to keep doing uh, various trips to raise funds. He would meet with Catherine Coleman in 1935, and instantly there was a connection between the both of them. He would divorce his wife, Jessie, claiming cruel and endangerment. Um, he said that his wife had tried to hurt him, and it got, went to court, and they agreed with him, and a divorce was agreed to. He had also demanded that she, Jesse, take the two sons. And I find this kind of interesting that if you're accusing somebody of, you know, cruel um, and endangering your life, why would you allow them to keep your children? He would never see his children again. He never wanted to. And he gave her the debt that he had accumulated up till then. So you start to see this man's, you know, um, true heart is that while he was preaching a good word, that word wasn't impacting him. Catherine Coleman, on the other hand, you will see the press even said about her that she was a very sincere lady. And so the message that she's preaching, you know, it has to get into you. The word says that the word bear fruit in you, and I believe once it's bear fruit in you, it can bear fruit through you. It's so important that what we preach, we have lived out, and that message is real to us. Um, but for Burroughs, that was not the case. So Catherine and Burroughs, they're caught occasionally in compromised positions where he's holding, etc. And several people became very concerned about what was going on and started to warn her, saying, you know, you've taught us how to understand the will of God. Why can't you catch it? regarding Burroughs. Uh, she actually preached several messages, and um, it's interesting as you look at some of the messages that she preached, you can see that God was convicting her during this time period. Um, she said, she preached the message called, Because I Want To, and said that God never brings Division. God never brings division among his people, so that something that God does will not cause division among the people. When she saw what she was doing, it was dividing the church. So God is speaking to her, and she was clicking, but you know what? We forget about it. We just cover it up and try to ignore it, and that's what she was doing. She said that when you really get into God's, when you really get God's love in your heart, it urges you to be careful about going to sin. It is a mighty constraining influence when you start to go into sin. It will help you determine not to. And this is a woman that really understood and had a great love for people. So this love that she had for God 
was really challenging her. It is very clear, as I said, as you look at many of the, the messages that she preached during this time period. Um, but Burroughs is really wooing her away. Some people start to notice that in the radio chapel, they were having financial issues. And they said of Burroughs that some of the problems they were suffering were because of his exorbitant salary, his living in a hotel, the new Buick that he bought for himself, and the new Oldsmobile for Catherine. So he was living a very extravagant life. He was really you know, pouring the blessings on Catherine to woo her over. Catherine also offered him the opportunity because she was a person that had great magnetism that drew people, draw great crowds, and he needed her help to raise funds. One of the things that he would do is he would hold fast when he was struggling financially and um, he would be very physically weak. And so he would ask Catherine Coleman to come to help and she would bring along uh, Helen Gulliford uh, and some other people to, on a regular basis, they went back and forth to Mason, Iowa to help raise fin uh, fin uh, funds for the radio chapel. Uh, I've tried to think about how much it would be in today's terms, but this was truly a very expensive uh, building. So they are starting to connect. Um, and while Catherine Coleman excuses her going back, that she's simply there to help, you know, uh, Burroughs, many people on the inside were very aware and saying something to her, she just wouldn't receive it. Catherine Coleman, ultimately, she knew that if she announced to the people that she was going to marry him, that they would not accept it. So what she ultimately did is she married him in 1938 in secret and never told anybody for two weeks. She turns up and tells them that she has married Burroughs and of course it did not go over very well. Um, and it would really begin a dark period in their life. What you see that during this time period where he is wooing her, he is going into financial problems and she is under heavy, heavy conviction. So God is clearly speaking, trying to say no. And when God says no, we've got to learn to listen. I don't know if you ever had it, you know, but I've heard clearly sometimes where God has said no. And a no from heaven never changes. When God says no, it's not a maybe, it's a no. And we need to hear that no and listen. So Catherine Coleman is getting a no. And God is clearly moving um, in such a way as to get their attention. But they never got it. And Burroughs, who was a great manipulator, um, is playing a game. The church ultimately, the radio chapel, would go into bankruptcy within one year of opening. Catherine uh, abandoned the ministry in Denver, gave it to somebody else, and joined Burroughs. And it looked up front like they had this really dynamic ministry because she would preach a message and then he would follow, and the two, minutes, two uh, messages seemed to complement each other. Uh, but things started to decline very quickly, and Catherine Coleman would pay a heavy price in many relationships that she lost. Her credibility was gone, and ultimately, her ministry would stall. They go to Mason, Iowa, and of course, that church has gone to bankruptcy. It would go into receivership um, as they sought to recuperate, I think it was like 140,000 at that time, which if you want to do the maths, convert it to modern figures. Uh, Burroughs would hand over the church to somebody else during that bankruptcy time so they could address the issues, but then he takes it back. Similar flaws that you see, for example, in Dowie, there are issues. This guy always has an issue with finances. In fact, they would linger throughout his whole life. Catherine knew there was a problem, but she refused to receive the correction from the Lord. It's said that on the, when, the immediate when she married him, she cried, and I believe that some like two weeks um, they were not seen together, where she is crying and recognizing, I have made a mistake. So she knew, even from the get-go, I've made a mistake. Their ministry would, you know, as I said, would begin to collapse. Um, he continues to travel. Uh, she would say in 1952 um, that 
She had left him eight years earlier in a Denver Post article. He writes his, his itinerary in 1946 saying that they have been together and that Catherine is going out east. I don't think he could ever understood that in 1946, while they were in Los Angeles, that she was leaving and never coming back. There came a day where she recognized that she had loved him more than she loved God. And she had to repent, put right, and put God first. And she had to leave him. There was no way that she could stay together with him. This is a man that is really a phony in so many ways. He's a fake. Uh, and it's destroying her ministry. And, you know, God had called her to a great purpose. And so God wants to re-get her back in line where she needs to be. There's a street that she walked where she said that she died and she can mark the place where she died. And I think we've all got to come to that place where we end and we stop building our kingdom and we've fully, completely surrendered. That place of where we've let go and all of the issues that we have carried for so long, the things that we played with that we never fully surrendered are addressed and it hurts. It was a heavy price for her to get back with the Lord and see her ministry come back. You know, many people, you know, you'll get put into this restoration period in the church and they'll put you on the bench and you never go forward. I often think, and I've talked to certain people like Robert Zerden on this, how he said to me, had Peter been put into restoration the way we do it in the modern day church, after he denied Jesus, he would have missed the day of Pentecost. So we've got to get a correct restoration that we're not stuck on the bench, but there's a true humility in breaking and allowing the Holy Spirit to begin to move us forward. So she would ultimately leave and go to a small town outside of Pittsburgh. She did not move to Pittsburgh initially. She moved to Franklin just outside of Pittsburgh, and it would really be a season for her to begin over. Many people have questioned why she went to Pittsburgh, and it may be that she had friends, she had some connections, but it was an opportunity to restart. Catherine realized that she had to completely start over again. The woman that now came forth was very different than the woman before. She's gone through a lot of stuff, and you see now that she's preaching a message out of a brokenness and out of a complete surrender. When you look at, for example, healing prior to her mistake, she would lay hands on people to see them healed. Now in her services, she has great worship and love of the Lord God. That's the emphasis. And as she's worshiping, people are healed. She lays hands on less people, but is seeing greater results. And there's a grieving in her when she sees people not receiving the healing. There's a more sensitivity to the Holy Ghost, a recognizing of her absolute dependence on Him and an emptying of herself. You start to see that more in her preaching and in her messages. Catherine Coleman realized, look, no good thing dwells in me. And I, if I don't have you, Lord, I don't have salt or a message for the people. Catherine Coleman was a person that she was very guarded. She did not share a lot about her personal life. The, the years with her husband, those eight years, really were classified as the deleted years. She would not talk much about it. She one, at one point did get a, a Valentine's card from Burroughs and it broke her heart. And she said, nobody will know the price that I paid for the ministry. Um, but she was sold out. One of the things you know, that had gotten her into trouble, of course, was her stubbornness. But understand that there are certain personality traits that we have, like she had with stubbornness, that need to be tempered. But it was critical, that stubbornness was a critical ingredient in her success. She was a pioneer lady in Idaho, in Denver. She plowed and she plowed and she refused to quit. That same stubbornness got her out of the crisis that her stubbornness got her into. Because she refused to let go of God and ultimately came out of it. You know, these personality traits that we have, once they're tempered by the Holy Spirit, 
become effective and really a major part of our life and ministry. So God chose you as a nobody, and there's certain things He wants to correct and get out of you. There's certain things He wants to temper in you so that you can be more effective and you can go and run the race set before you effectively until you receive the prize. It's important as we run the race that our eyes are focused on Jesus and on the smile on His face and Him saying, well done, and not people. I'm glad that Catherine Coleman did not surround herself with yes people that always agreed with her, but people that did challenge her, people that were disturbed by her behavior and said something. And so that there's this ongoing conviction around her that has had ultimately brought her back. It's interesting that she shared after she got married a message based on David saying, take not your Holy Spirit from me. I think she fully recognized the Holy Spirit was gone. And when that anointing's gone, you know, troubles come. You know, you go through difficult times. And when you're under the anointing, you know, many of the trials of the righteous, but he delivers them out of them all. And you see that they can go through great persecution and trials, and God always turns up and gives them the breakthrough. But when you step into a place where you're out of God's will and out of that protection, you start to feel the, the burn of the situations. They're not having the success. The money's not coming forth. And as I said, everything they were doing collapses because it's not God's purpose. Well, Catherine Coleman, as I said, returned, was restored as an incredible lady. And that's the ministry that we look to today is the Catherine Coleman. But you have to look at her in light of what she went through, those trials, those difficulties and how she was broken by her own stupidity and stood recognizing, I blew it. You know, it will put in you a great compassion and understanding. It will change your preaching because you realize I've got to get it for myself. It's not good enough for me to get in the Word and preach a nice word. I've got to get it for myself and it's got to change me. That's what happened to Catherine Coleman. Well, I pray that this message has blessed you, inspired you. Please check out the episode one where we're looking at her life and shortly we'll record the final period of her life where she goes to Pittsburgh and it's the woman that we've come to know regarding Catherine Coleman. May this lesson bless you to so check out some of the other documentaries and nuggets from Catherine Coleman and other heroes of faith. May they inspire, encourage you, and help catapult you into your divine purpose. I believe that we're living in the last days and that Jesus is coming soon. And that God wants us to step up to the plate and fulfill our purpose. I also believe that we're going to see the greatest revival. And I'm asking you to check us out on Facebook and join with us in praying every day for revival. Thank you for watching. We pray for you daily. May you be blessed, encouraged, and provoked in the Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name.